This is a lecture concerning the implications for biological psychiatry of what are called monist models of mind. And in particular, I'll be focusing on the work of the philosophers Daniel Dennett and John Searle. The primary claim of biological psychiatry is that in some vital explanatory sense, mental disorder just is a form of brain disorder. Now we need to be very, very clear in our minds exactly what is the nature of this claim. The starting point for any consideration of this kind is the work of the French philosopher and polymath René Descartes, who died in 1650. Uh, he formulated the mind-body problem in terms of two substances, and this has led to the historical notion of what is called substance dualism. Dualism simply means that there are two forms of something available, and when you talk about substance dualism, you're saying that there are two entities of profoundly different substances, and we have to make sense of those to make sense of our philosophy. Now, if mind and body are of a different nature, how can they interact without breaching the law of conservation of mass energy? So you can see a skyscraper there where it's written on the side E equals MC squared. And this is an item of information, and the important thing to understand, of course, is that uh, while humans can have information of that nature in their minds, neurons can't. So Descartes took the starting point that the animal body is a physical machine only. Humans have a physical body, but they also have a supernatural soul which acts upon the body via the pineal gland by pulling on nerve fibers. Now, it's clear, immediately clear to anybody who uh, has aware of the implications of it that the if the supernatural soul is not a material entity that is to say it's not of the physical realm how then can it interact with the physical body and important to remember that Descartes probably didn't actually believe this if you read his work you'll find that at, at different points he seems to be implying that humans didn't have a soul or if they did it could be understood in material terms but the history is important. Descartes was certainly aware that uh, Galileo had had a rather nasty accident with the Inquisition in, in 1616, and I don't think he wanted a repetition. So he left the soul in the body, uh, guiding it like some sort of um, little man inside the head, and that way he satisfied everybody's requirements. But I think he himself was smart enough to know that a supernatural soul couldn't act on the material body. So now we come to uh, modern times and the first philosopher to consider here is the um, resident philosopher at Tufts University in Boston, Massachusetts, Daniel Dennett. Now Dennett says, dualism is forlorn. I will explain consciousness without ever giving in to the siren song of dualism. And if you read his uh, later works, it's quite clear, he said that in his first year in college, so he must have been about 18 at the time, he, he arrived at the conclusion that any and all forms of dualism are inherently irrational. He said, quote, how on earth could my thoughts and feelings fit in the same world with the nerve cells and the molecules that made up my brain, unquote. And you can see what he's saying. He's quite clear in his mind that uh, the brain is um, of the material realm, of the physical world, but this peculiar thing called a mind uh, has to be something profoundly different because you can open the skull, crack open anybody's skull and you'll see a brain, but if you crack open their head you will not see a soul. So he said further, the various phenomena of consciousness are all physical effects of the brain's activities. So he's now declaring his position uh, with respect to this peculiar thing called the soul. He says further, a theory of the biological mechanisms, and I've put in, a, um, I've paraphrased him here, but he says of brain would resolve the, quote, traditional paradoxes and mysteries of, con of consciousness. Now he clearly sees dualism as crude magical thinking which violates the fundamental laws of the universe. And at different points in his more recent books, he's become very agitated over this. He says, accepting dualism is giving up. 
Other times he mocks the idea. Quote, I wiggle my finger by what? Wiggling my soul? And another time he says, he calls it ectoplasm, which is very derisory. And then at one final point he says it's wonder tissue. And of free will he said, it's like the little green man in the control room of the man-sized puppet in the morgue in Men in Black. That seems to be a pretty clear statement of his position. He's now uh, mocking it as a, an homunculus, which means a little man inside the head that controls the larger body. Uh, and he again says that it's like an immaterial portion of glowing ectoplasm that oozes around in your brain like a ghost amoeba. Another point, he says, the soul or the consciousness uh, is an angel whose wings are folded till you're called to fly to heaven. And he, finally, he says, the, there is the lurking suspicion that the most attractive feature of mind stuff is its promise of being so mysterious that it keeps science at bay forever. If dualism is the best we can do, then we can't understand human consciousness. Now that and leads him to the clearest possible statement of monism. That is to say that there is only one substance in the, the universe. Dualism, as you remember, is that there are two substances, one which is the material and one which is something else. So he states, quote, somehow the brain must be the mind. And it seems to me, to my way of thinking, that that is a very, very clear statement of monism. That is absolutely excluding the possibility that there could be some other substance in the universe beside the material substances that we can touch and feel and weigh and cut up. He is leading to the, impl oh, sorry, the implication of that is that a full explanation of the brain will explain all there is to know about the mind. Now, this leads to the classic quandary that brain is made of, the brain is made of molecules, but molecules do not have mental properties. So how do mental properties arise from a bunch of molecules squished inside the skull? He said, his answer is, when language came into existence, it brought into existence the kind of mind that can transform itself on a moment's notice into a somewhat different virtual machine, taking on new projects, following new rules, adopting new policies. He said, we are transformers. And that he put it in quotes in his original work, that's what a mind is, as contrasted with a mere brain, the control system of a chameleonic transformer, a virtual machine for making more virtual machines, unquote. And I think that's a very, very important statement. And I'll come back and explain this in a moment. He says further, human consciousness is itself a huge complex that can best be understood as the operation of a von Neumann-esque virtual machine implemented in the parallel architecture of a brain that was not designed for any such activities. The power of this virtual machine vastly enhances the underlying powers of the organic hardware on which it runs. Now the term von Neumann-esque refers to the Hungarian-born mathematician John von Neumann, who uh, in about 1948, or starting in from during the Second World War and then into the 50s, uh, defined the architecture of computers as we know them, so that people will now talk about uh, a computer running on a von Neumann architecture. So he's a very, very important person in that he did so much to uh, formulate the, the principles on which mod the modern computational revolution has taken place. So Danet further can, says, our brains weave, quote, a web of discourses. And I've um, paraphrased him. This web is as much a biological product as any of the other constructions to be found in the animal world. Now here you can see him making a very, very bold claim. This is really putting his neck out, sorry, really going out onto a, 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 a long spindly branch here to say that the um, the mind or consciousness, as he prefers to use, is a biological product. He says further, quote, selves and minds and even consciousness itself are biological products. And at different points, he uses examples of what he means by biological products as a spider weaving its web, a snail secreting its shell, or a beaver building its dam using mud. So this is a pretty clear, definitive statement 
after many, many years of hard